And again, welcome everybody. Uh, again, this is our Cornell Cooperative Extension program here this evening. And our topic is vegetable gardening, especially vegetable gardening maybe for those who have not done it before or are very new to the subject. So we'll cover a lot of the very basics tonight. And um, that's kind of a good thing to do. I have to kind of remind myself what the basics are. I've been vegetable gardening off and on for probably 50 years. And when you say that, you really realize how old you are. <laughs> I started very young, I guess I could say. So um, this program was based on a PowerPoint I stole from Cornell. And that PowerPoint, PowerPoint was entitled, 10 Things You Need to Know for a Successful Vegetable Garden. So some of the content in this is that PowerPoint and some of it is my own and I kind of tried to meld it together. So I've never done this PowerPoint before, so we'll see how successful we are. So again, if you have any questions, type them in the chat box and I promise you we'll take a look at those at the end. And maybe Kathy, if, if something goes wrong, you'll chime in and if suddenly the picture goes black or something like that, that would be helpful. I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. So um, I should mention that this is one of our programs in the series called Back to Home Basics. And this is put on by our marketing committee at Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, these are on Tuesdays uh, in the evening and there's a series of them. And there's a few more of these coming up. Um, I don't have a list of what those are, but you can check out our Facebook page which would be uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County on Facebook. And there's a list of them there. It's also on our website, which is cceRensselaer.org. Um, you can find those programs. So they've had a number of really neat programs about cooking and uh, there's gonna be one coming up about backyard chickens, I believe, um, and natural areas of Rensselaer County and a lot of good things like that. So check those out. Uh, the other programs that we have going on are the ones in our Lunch in the Garden series, and these are on Wednesdays at noon. Um, we've had over 20 of these um, in our series, and um, if you'd like to participate in those, they'll be also on the Facebook page as well as the website, um, or you can give me an email. My email is there. It's dhc3 at cornell.edu. And just say that you would like to be signed up to receive the notifications uh, for the Lunch in the Garden programs. Uh, the next one of those coming up is going to be April 7th. It's going to be about straw bale gardening, which is a great subject in uh, growing vegetables. That would be a cool way to grow a vegetable garden with straw bales. Um, on April 14th, uh, the week after that, we're going to have a program on uh, why you should use native plants in your garden. And then two weeks after that, on April 28th, I believe it is, the last Wednesday in April, we're going to be talking about raised bed gardening. So a lot of those programs coming up in April and again on Wednesdays at noon. And let us know if you'd like to get a notification of those. Okay, um, another free thing we have going on right now is out in front of our building at 61 State Street in Troy. Um, we have a mailbox full of free seeds. Uh, we were gifted with a lot of seeds that were left over from the 2020 sales season that didn't sell from one of the local big box stores. And they literally gave us thousands of seed packets and we've been putting them out in our little mailbox. Um, the mailbox is replenished periodically and almost uh, we're running out of seeds, but we have a lot of flower seeds as well as vegetable seeds. Uh, in the little mailbox. You're welcome to stop by any time, day or night, as long as the supplies last. I imagine that's going to be out there maybe, maybe another week. I don't have that many seeds left. So if you'd like to go get some free seeds, uh, check out the free seed mailbox at 61 State Street in Troy. Okay, so why should you grow a vegetable garden? That's kind of where I started out with this program. And I think there's a lot of great reasons, especially nowadays with the pandemic, maybe people have had a little bit more time at home. Um, but there's a lot of reasons and I just listed some of them here. Uh, save money, well, maybe you'll save money. Uh, maybe not the first year if you have a lot of setting up to do or equipment to buy, but over the long term, you could certainly save money by growing your own vegetables. Uh, you'll certainly get outdoors, enjoy the sunshine, get a little fresh air, that's for sure. Uh, maybe you're gonna learn a new skill 
It's never too late to learn about gardening. It's a wonderful activity and fun for the whole family. And you never know, maybe your kids or your spouse or your in-laws or whoever you garden with will really take to it as well. Um, you know, sometimes people really get involved in a multi-generational garden, which is a wonderful thing. Certainly, it's great to know where your food comes from. Uh, you'll know what was sprayed on it or was not sprayed on it, what kind of tomato that is that you grew and where it came from, which is a wonderful feeling of food security. And um, I really think that homegrown vegetables do taste better. I'm a big grower of potatoes and most people, I think, think potatoes are just rather bland. But if you've never grown a potato and had a potato that was just dug out of the ground, you've never really tasted a potato. They are incredible uh, when you grow them those. Grow them yourself. And I think that's really true of a lot of the other vegetables too. There's nothing like that ripe tomato that comes off of your own tomato plant. So you'll have some wonderful produce to cook and enjoy and maybe process and maybe freeze or can for the future. So lots of reasons to grow a vegetable garden. Uh, now the old PowerPoint had this slide in it and it said uh, reasons why vegetable gardens fail. And I thought, well, that's kind of a negative way to look at it. But I left it in here and I thought it was kind of important. Um, why do vegetable gardens fail? Because I really believe in what they said here. Certainly poor planning, and that's hopefully something we're not gonna do after listening to the program tonight. You're gonna have a little bit more knowledge in that area. Uh, too shady gardens, especially vegetable gardens, really need a lot of sun, so we'll talk about that. Uh, too big, if you start out too ambitious, you get a little overwhelmed and maybe then you slack off and then maybe you don't continue um, in the next year. But start out small or start out relatively modest. I think that's a good way to go. And you can always get bigger next year. And certainly too many weeds are a big problem. Uh, the weeds grow fast and you're gonna have weeds um, to battle. So sometimes people get very disappointed with the weeds if they don't keep up with them. And that may be a little bit daunting. Uh, too far from water. Um, I had a community vegetable garden one time in Columbus, Ohio, and there was no water. <laughs> the place was huge. It was this giant barren field. And you can't grow vegetables without water, really. So if you don't have water close by or it's hard to get to, um, that may be a problem. Uh, too close in spacing. Certainly, we'll talk about reading the uh, seed packet, looking at some references to make sure you plant your plants far enough apart because they really do need some space and planted too soon or too late. You know, we've had some good weather now, but it's still too early to plant vegetables. So we'll talk about when the right time to start is. Uh, so here's a list of the basics. We'll talk about all those things, so I won't pause there. Uh, but really the question is, how do you set up your first vegetable garden? So that's where we're gonna be heading towards tonight. So the first thing I'd like to talk about would be the location and really paramount, I think in the choosing a location is the sunlight. Uh, you know, these vegetable plants really want a lot of sun. And here it says we need a four, uh, four hours minimum of sunlight for leafy vegetables. And that would be things like spinach. And that really is a minimum. So if you have a vegetable garden that's getting less than that, it's really not gonna be very successful. Uh, four hours is the minimum and that's really the minimum for the leafy vegetables, things like, you know, spinach, lettuce, those can really tolerate lower light conditions. Uh, four to six hours for uh, leafy and root vegetables like the onion there. And really, if you wanna grow that tomato or a plant like a squash, something that develops its fruit from a flower, you really need at least uh, six to eight hours. I would say that's really a minimum. Uh, my yard, my garden is getting shadier and shadier as the big trees around my house get bigger and bigger. And I find that there's uh, areas where it's getting harder to grow um, any kind of garden. And so last summer I did what I call a sunlight study. And I chose a couple days in June where I was going to be working from home. And I set my alarm on my uh, smartphone. And I went out um, every hour at the top of the hour and I took a picture of several different parts of my yard, and I can gauge now how sunny some of those areas are, at least in June, when we have a, the longest days of sunlight. And maybe that's something you need to do. You maybe need to really do some observations in 
your yard or where you're going to plant your vegetable garden to really choose the right area to choose the sunniest spot you can. And this picture of my raised bed with my tomato plants in it, it looks great there in the sunshine, but boy, it took until about 10 o'clock in the morning for the sun to hit that. And really by three o'clock, 3.30, that was really in shade again. So my sunlight is diminishing and that's gonna be a problem for me. Okay, another thing you wanna avoid are certain plants like the walnut tree. Here they have a picture of a walnut tree, the black walnut, very common in our area. And that picture of the field there is a tomato field showing the tomatoes not doing well that are nearest a black walnut tree because the black walnut exudes a chemical called juggalone and the juggalone inhibits the growth of other plants. So don't plant your garden near a walnut tree, under a walnut tree, or really where the walnut tree's leaves are gonna drop because those leaves also contain the juggalone. So if you need to learn how to identify a tree, um, you know, look up walnut, I'm sure you can find some pictures and, and make sure you stay away from that kind of an area. Uh, also in location, we have all, already alluded to this one, water. Um, you know, it could be a dry summer, uh, it could be a wet summer, we have no idea. Generally, you're gonna wanna water your garden thoroughly uh, with maybe an inch to an inch and a, half and a half of water if you don't get rain in a week. And the closer it is to the water, the better. Um, you know, you can have a long hose. I have long hoses set up in my yard um, and that, that's something you can overcome. But if you really don't have water anywhere near, you're gonna be carrying it in buckets like the lady in the picture and that's not gonna be too much fun. So try to have your garden near a water source uh, because that's very important. Uh, then, you know, another big thing is the soil, right? The soil, of course, can make or break your garden. And we talk about soil uh, conditions of a couple different uh, ways here. Uh, you know, soil is a big topic that master gardeners and people like me like to talk a lot about, and we'll just really have time to touch on it pretty briefly tonight. Uh, we'll talk about pH, which uh, is a measure of acidity or alkalinity. Uh, we'll talk about the organic matter in the soil. We'll talk a little bit about fertilizer and really just touch upon some of these things uh, very lightly here. Uh, you can decide you are going to work with the soil you have or you can bring in new soil. And oftentimes I have people ask me, should I just go get new soil? Well, I always like to think that I would rather work with the soil I have. Um, and maybe if it's very sandy, I add some organic matter. Maybe if it's got a low pH, I add some lime. And I try to work with what I have. I can certainly call somebody up and buy topsoil, but we're never quite sure what that's gonna be either. Uh, of course, you, you have to do that if you're using raised beds maybe, but if you're growing in the ground, uh, really see if you can work with the soil that you have there. Um, that's kind of where I would start at least. So soil testing, that's something that we do a lot at Cooperative Extension. And this idea of pH, this measure of alkalinity or acidity, uh, we would like to have a pH of about 6.2 to 7.2, slightly acidic to very slightly alkaline. 7.0 is neutral. Uh, so that was something that we would test the soil for. And um, if we want to change that, it's not that hard to change that. That's something we can do. Uh, the nutrient levels, those are a little bit harder to test for, as well as the organic matter. And also the soil type, I'll touch upon that in just a second. But let's talk more about this pH idea. And basically, why is it important? And when we always talk about this, we show a complicated looking chart like this one here. And basically I'll say what you really want to have in the back of your mind is you want to have the pH in the right range, that 6.2 to 7.2 or thereabouts, because that determines the levels of nutrients that are in the soil and how available those are to the plant. And if the pH is way low, way acidic or way high, way alkaline, those nutrients like the phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, boron, copper, zinc, molybdenum, are not gonna be available to the plant or some of them aren't gonna be available and your plants are gonna suffer. So that's why we worry about pH. It determines how well the nutrients are available to our plants. And then if we need to change the pH, hopefully we're making those nutrients a little bit more available. 
So we can help with that if you want to bring a soil sample to Cornell Cooperative Extension. This is a picture of what the soil test kit looks like. We can sell you a kit, um, but we don't really need to do that. You don't need to buy one of those. You could just take uh, some samples of the soil that you're going to be growing in, bring it to our office. You can uh, go on our website, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County website. That, if you Google that, you'll come right to it. Uh, you can print out a form and you can bring your soil sample and the form to our office and let us know you're in the parking lot. We'll come down, <laughs> get your soil sample, do your test and let you know if you need to add lime or sulfur. And um, then you can go from there. And really spring is a great time to put down lime or sulfur and uh, get the soil into the range you want it to be, okay? Um, so here's a picture of our website there, ccerensalier.org. And there's a couple pages on soil testing. It tells you how to take the sample and you can print out the little form and fill that out and bring it to us. Or you can mail it to us too. People send these in the mail. Um, we really need very little soil. A half a cup is more than enough really to do a pH test. So it's not a big deal um, as far as the amount of soil that we need, okay? Uh, if you wanna test for the nutrients. Now nutrients of course are important to the plants. And those would be things like the phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, aluminum, iron, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can send a sample off to UMass. UMass is the state uh, university over in Massachusetts. They do a really nice job at the soil lab over there. And they'll give you, if you send them a soil sample uh, on a form that looks like this, they'll give you a really nice report that tells you the nutrient levels. And they'll also tell you uh, what type of fertilizer you need. So if you're really new to this, you're starting out in a new place, you have no idea what the condition of the soil is, this is really worth uh, doing. It's about $20, $25, I think. And uh, you get a nice report back. And also I have down there, it will give you the lead level. It'll tell you if there's lead in the soil to any degree that you have to worry about. And if you're gardening in an urban area uh, where there's been a lot of old buildings with old lead paint on them over the years, that's kind of a nice thing to know. So uh, what you can do here, we would send this off for you to UMass normally. Probably nowadays with the pandemic and all, it's just as easy for you to Google UMass soil testing. And uh, you can print out this form and send it off and get the report. And uh, really, it's a very readable report. So uh, you'll, you'll probably uh, not to have too many questions with that, but they have a great website that answers the questions too. Um, so you would like to know uh, a little bit about the texture of your soil, and that means the relative amount of sand, silt, and clay. That's what soil is made up of. Sand particles are the largest relative size of a basketball. Silt particles are smaller. In terms of sports, it's a golf ball, and the clay particles are very tiny, like the kernel of corn. And ideally our soil would have equal parts of this sand, silt, and clay being a loam. Now that would be the nice kind of soil that everybody would love to have. Um, not everybody has that, but you can determine that uh, by doing a, a test called the soil texture by field, which I'll tell you about uh, in just a second, or I'll show you a way you can figure that out if you're inclined to do that. Um, and that would be watching this video. I guess I could say this is maybe some homework here for those of you that really want to learn about soil. If you go to YouTube and type in, again, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County, we have on our YouTube channel this program. It was recorded last spring, and the dirt on soil tells you how to buy soil, and it will also tell you how to evaluate your soil with a lot more details. And a new gardener, you know, this could get a little overwhelming, but if you're really into soil, I would take a look at this because it will tell you how to determine the sand, silt, and clay uh, percentages in your soil and what it's all about. Okay, so that's a great way to learn more about your soil. Uh, let's talk about actually preparing your soil. Now you could, if you're gonna have a big vegetable garden in a flat area on your backyard maybe, you could call up a fellow like this and he could come with his Troy built rototiller and till up a patch for you. And that would be just perfectly fine. Um, you know, that's, that's something that uh, 
not everybody's going to want to buy, right? <laughs> You're not going to want to go out and buy a rototiller for a couple thousand dollars or whatever they are now. So you can certainly have some somebody come and do this for you, uh, or you could probably still rent one of these at a home center. It's been a long time since I've done that, but I imagine you can still do that and till up your own soil um, or have somebody come do that for you. Or if you're very athletic, um, and really in any case, you're gonna wanna have a few basic tools for your vegetable garden. So here we've got a variety of different shovels. Um, I like a long handled pointy shovel, like the second one there in the graphic. Uh, that's my personal favorite, um, but really it depends on how tall you are. Um, if you're a little bit shorter, you might like a shorter shovel. Um, here's a couple pictures of my tools that I've gotten over the years. Uh, the first shovel, the yellow handled shovel there, that's really a kind of a specialty shovel. That's a spearhead spade. That's good for really digging very compacted soil. Uh, the second shovel there, that's your classic shovel that I think probably everybody should have. Um, the long handled shovel, uh, they're shorter handled versions if you're a little bit shorter or feel more comfortable with one of those. But that shovel is gonna do a lot of work in your vegetable garden. And of course, the other tool there is the fork, another classic vegetable garden tool. And you can find a lot of these kind of tools at garage sales, estate sales, places like that if you're not wanting to invest in a whole lot of money up front. Maybe borrow them from your neighbor's garage, but of course, then you have to return them. But, but see if you can find some of these. Uh, I don't know if people are doing garage sales during the pandemic, but that's a good place in normal times to find uh, so, some good old tools. And the other one I really like for vegetable gardening too is what I call the steel rake, because you can turn over your soil with the fork or the shovel and then smooth it out with the rake. And then you're really gonna be ready to go. Okay, a few other things I like to have on hand would be a trowel like this old one here that I got at a garage sale. Measuring tape always comes in handy because if I'm putting my tomato plants in two and a half feet apart, what does that really look like? So, you know, it's nice to have either a yardstick or a measuring tape or something like that. And a variety of labels. Um, if you plant a row of beans, you wanna put a label on them somehow to make sure that you remember those beans are there, right? And I have some nice wooden labels there, or I like to use old blinds that are cut up and made into little sections and you can write with a Sharpie marker on there and have some nice labels. Um, in my prepared PowerPoint, they give me pictures of this broad fork here. That's another great digging tool. I don't own one of those, but if you really get into vegetable gardening, you might want to get one of these. A lot of very serious vegetable gardeners like to dig with a broad fork because it really is uh, a great tool to turn the soil over with and uh, works very nicely. Okay, so there's my raised bed vegetable garden and my shovel, and I can just go through that and turn over my soil relatively easily. So you might say, well, how deep should I be tilling this soil? And ideally, we would probably want to have a minimum of maybe six inches, six to eight inches. Probably a rototiller is going to give you about that. And with a shovel, you're going to be able to do maybe mm, five, six inches, something like that. And for most crops, that's usually pretty good. Um, so you don't have to dig down to China. Um, Another thing you really want to avoid is working your soil when it's wet. We've had a lot of wet weather lately. And if you have wet soil and you're turning it over and stepping on it, you're going to really cause what we call compaction, especially if you have clay in your soil. So don't turn your soil over when it's very wet. Wait till it dries out a little bit. Um, we don't want to make pottery out of our soil. We don't want to compact it a lot. So. So wait a few days after it rains, hopefully you have some nice clear weather, and then it, that's the good time to turn it over or dig it. And also, you know, a lot of gardeners tend to like to turn their soil over a couple times a year in the spring and the fall, especially if you own a rototiller. But be aware that this thing called organic matter, which is carbon-based and which a lot of our soil organisms feed on, it's very important for the soil health. Every time we turn over our soil, that stimulates more of that to reduce in volume. So uh, a lot of modern vegetable gardeners now only turn their soil over once a year and really try to reduce how many times they do that. So there's another one of my vegetable garden, uh, raised beds I should say, that I plant my vegetables in. I want to add some organic matter. 
So what is organic matter? Maybe it's compost, maybe it's old manure, okay? Um, it can be leaf compost, it can be manure compost. Those are two of your most popular things. And I wanna maybe put an inch or an inch and a half, maybe two inches across the top of the soil. In the picture there, that darker material where the soil or the shovel is sticking out, that's compost from my leaf uh, pile that I make. Um, you can also buy compost. You can buy bagged products like the little picture there, or you could go to a local garden center and see if they sell compost in bulk. And if you're really ambitious, you might get a couple yards of compost if your garden is big enough. But really, if you add an inch or two over the top, and turn that into your soil, uh, that would be a good thing to do as well. And if you're really breaking ground for the first time and you have the ambition and energy, I would probably turn over the soil first, then I would put my organic matter over the top and I would turn that in again. Um, hopefully uh, that might maybe take a lot of energy, a lot of work, um, but that would be maybe the ideal. But try to work some organic matter into the soil. And ideally in the fall or the early spring now, those are good times to do that. And again, it can be purchased in bags or in bulk. And there's different types of compost. Usually your compost that comes from manure is gonna have more nutrients in it than the compost that comes from leaves and um, lawn clippings and things like that. Um, we don't really have time to talk about making a compost bin per se tonight, but you'll have things like weeds and unused vegetables and you know various types of organic matter that you can put into a compost bin. So you might wanna look into doing composting um, as a new gardener. Eventually you're gonna to wanna to have compost on your own, of your own to put into your garden. So composting is really not that hard to do. These folks here have basically the whole thing uh, in a nutshell in these pictures. You make a round wire bin usually. Uh, you put your organic matter in there, leaves, uh, weeds without a lot of seeds on them maybe, um, spent vegetables, those kind of things. And that turns into this wonderful compost. And we do have a compost program, a compost webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you could take a look at that. And maybe we'll go over composting again some other time. But that's another topic for another day. It's a huge big topic in and of itself. Uh, I did put a picture of my compost bin here. This is kind of a long compost bin you can see. It's not particularly, um, you know, the most attractive thing, but for a gardener this is kind of, you know, exciting stuff, right? Uh, on the far left we have a pile of finished compost that's been there uh, breaking down and really finished and turned into this wonderful dark material that's ready to spread on a, on a garden. In the middle, we have the slow composting that takes several years. Uh, that's leaves, old bits of ornamental grasses. Uh, we put our kitchen scraps in there. And on the closest bin here on the right, that's material that really needs to be screened because it's kind of mixed up um, with material that's slow composting as well as finished, finished compost as well. So. Um, I would urge you to look into composting as a new vegetable gardener. It's a great thing that is really a companion activity with vegetable gardening. Um, and you don't have to have the fast compost that people talk about. You can do it slow like I do. Okay, and then people want to know what kind of fertilizer to use. And boy, is that a big topic. So I would say that there's a lot of different fertilizers out there. Uh, you'll go to the garden center and see many of them for sale. Now, if you did that UMass test, which we talked about earlier, they're gonna tell you add X, Y, and Z, and they're gonna give you some direction to go. But if you don't really have that test, you can go to a store and look at some of these fertilizers and hopefully on the package, they're gonna give you some basic information about how much to add. And you can sort of just guess, but that's kind of what it's gonna be. It's gonna be sort of a guess. So. There's many organic fertilizers, maybe composed of things like manures and composts, fish emulsion, bone meal, rock phosphate, green sand, lots of different of these uh, quote unquote organic or natural materials. Um, if I had a friend that had maybe a very well rotted manure pile of some sort of manure, I might use some of that, but I wouldn't use 
manure that I could still identify. Um, and my, what I mean by that is if it looks like a horse manure and you can still see the apples in it, don't use that, it's not broken down. And also be aware that some of the manures can have a lot of weed seeds in them. So you can really get into a bit of trouble there. Um, there's also synthetic fertilizers, things like miracle Grow, urea, superphosphate. These will be labeled with the three numbers. And the 5105 means it has 5% nitrogen, 10% uh, potassium, or 10% phosphorus, and 5% potassium. So you could choose one of those and um, add some of that. Uh, and again, there's many ways to do this. The soil test, follow a general recommendation, read the bag and see what you want to do uh, with a label on the bag. Um, a general, another general way to go is Cornell will say to add 1.25 pounds of 10-10-10 or 2.5 pounds of 5-10-5 per 100 square feet and turn that into the soil. So that's another way you can look at it going by a general recommendation like that. Um, another general recommendation is an old time one, one bushel of well-rotted chicken manure or two bushels of well-rotted cow manure. Now I had to think, what's a bushel? because nobody knew, knows what bushels are anymore. And I kind of worked it out. And I think if you add about a quarter of an inch to maybe a little bit more over 100 square feet, you're going to be in the ballpark with one of those. But again, make sure this is manure that's been maybe around for a year or at least that long. Um, and it's very well rotted. You don't want to use any kind of fresh manure. OK. Uh, when do I apply these things? Again, spring and fall. Now is a good time to start working on that. Spread the fertilizer over the surface, turn it into that top four to six inches, rake it smooth with your steel rake. And then you can also give uh, your transplants, such as tomatoes, a starter solution. Uh, some weak fish emulsion, some weak miracle grow in a water. That's a good thing. And also you'll read about uh, side dressing. If you want to give your plants a little bit of extra fertilizer, a handful of uh, fish emulsion, or I should say a handful of 10-10-10, a dressing of fish emulsion, seaweed extract, um, you know, maybe once a month, maybe once every six weeks during the summer. That's also a good practice. Okay, so watering we touched upon. We'll talk about that very briefly. Again, be prepared to do some watering. Um, it's better to water deeply, maybe twice a week, rather than shallowly. You don't really need to get the leaves very wet. Um, and if you're going to really overhead water, water early in the morning. You don't want to water at night. And the reason why you don't want to water uh, too late in the evening or at night is because then things stay wet. And when things stay wet, we have fungus come along. So it's much better to water in the morning, let the plants dry out, and that's going to reduce any chances of fungus coming along, okay? We also have other ways to water with drip hoses and trickle, uh, which I'll show you a one picture in a minute. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, how much water to put on. I go out, if I'm gonna water my tomato plants, I give them about a gallon of water at a time, uh, each one. That's gonna really soak into the ground. You wanna really give them a good soaking, I think is the most important thing, rather than lightly sprinkling. Uh, because lightly sprinkling often doesn't really get the water down into the root zone. So give, give the garden a good soaking. Again, if it's raining out, you don't have to be too worried about that. But checking your watering is an important thing. Uh, the good old plastic watering can there, they can't really go too wrong with that. Uh, these one gallon water or milk jugs here, they have a very small hole poked in the bottom. They're filled with water and then that water just kind of oozes out and those are going to be really doing a nice job to water those little tiny tomato plants there. So I like that kind of a system. Uh, here's a weeping hose or a soaker hose. Again, trickling out, watering those pepper plants. Um, the water soaks in very slowly and really uh, the plant has time to take it up. So there's a lot of great systems there. Uh, you might want to invest in, if you're, it's your first year, maybe you can just water by hand. I really like that uh, tool that's in that lower picture. I call that a water wand. Um, it's just really a little shower head that's on a, a, a pipe there. Uh, you can buy those pretty cheaply at a hardware store or garden center. And that makes watering uh, things like vegetable plants a lot easier. Okay. 
So we can also water overhead, and these are pictures of folks doing that. But again, this really gets a lot of the leaves wet. Do this in the morning or during the day, let it dry out before night comes. And it's not really very efficient either. So if you have any kind of limits on your water, say you're on a shallow well or something like that, this is not the most efficient way to provide water. Uh, the soaker hose is definitely the way to go. And you can get a little uh, irrigation gauge, or I should say a rain gauge and put in your garden. And I, let, I do that. I, all summer I'm checking how much it rained because we really want to have maybe an inch to an inch and a half of rain during the growing season each week. And if you don't measure it, you don't really have a good idea of how much fell. You might be sleeping all night. Maybe you think it rained a lot and really only rained two cents of an inch. Uh, so that little rain gauge is a great investment. Uh, or you can use a straight-sided can. That looks like it might have been a cat food can. And just take a ruler and measure how much rain came down. Uh, very low tech, some of these gardening things. So let's talk about the plants. What are you going to grow? Well, now or in the winter, make a list of what vegetables you want to grow. Grow what you like to eat. Um, I've met people that grow vegetables they don't like. <laughs> and I've never quite understood that. They'll say, I grow beets and I really don't like beets and nobody in the family eats them anymore, but I still grow them. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially for your first vegetable garden. Grow the things that you really want to eat because you're going to be more interested in those and uh, be more excited about those, I think. So don't grow vegetables that you or your family don't have a lot of interest in. Try something maybe new. Maybe you're uh, always wondered what, you know, uh, Brussels sprouts tasted like. Well, Brussels sprouts are pretty darn easy to grow from uh, transplants you can get at a nursery or a garden center in the spring. Very easy to grow. So maybe you've always wanted to try good, fresh Brussels sprouts. I have to say they're one of my favorite vegetables. They're really good when they're fresh. And I would say for beginners, maybe choose six to eight things you really are interested in and study up on those. Um, you know, I'm not going to have time to talk about each of those uh, tonight, but let's say you want to grow Brussels sprouts. Let's say you want to grow tomatoes. Let's say you want to grow potatoes. Pick just a few things and really stick with those and, and read up on those and figure out how to do the best job you can with those. Rather than, you know, choose the top 20 vegetables and try to grow them all your first season. Um, you know, maybe being moderate is maybe a good thing just for uh, the beginning couple of years. Uh, so where are these plants coming from? Well, we can uh, do what we call direct sow a lot of things, and that's where we buy seeds and dr directly plant the seeds in the ground. Uh, so you got to ask yourself, where are you going to buy these seeds? Well, we could go to a local garden center, hardware store, uh, places like that right now and look through their seed collections. Go seed shopping soon, or we can go online, look in catalogs, places like that. But now is really the time to do that. Uh, and a lot of these things are going to be selling out uh, fairly rapidly, I think. You can also um, give some of these a head start indoors. We're coming to the point where we're getting uh, limited in time with that. You could still start some seeds now. It's the beginning of April. Uh, we have just enough time to maybe start tomatoes from seed, but really they take about eight weeks to, to really get going. So you've got to be aware of that sort of thing. Much easier, of course, is to go to a garden center or nursery in May or late April, depending on what you want, and buy seedlings or transplants. So a couple terminology points here. Sowing seed directly outdoors means buying the seed and putting it in the ground. And a lot of crops we can do that with. Or we can buy a transplant or a seedling and plant that living plant. So those are two ways that we get a lot of our crops started. So I just wanted to mention my top picks here and why I grow some of these things and how I do it. Uh, tomatoes and broccoli, usually I buy my transplants from a garden center. Sometimes I grow them myself. Sometimes a friend of mine grows some, but I start tomatoes and broccoli from little seedlings. Potatoes, I buy seed potatoes, which are basically whole potatoes from the garden center or mail order. I cut those up and leave each piece with a couple eyes, let them sit for a couple days, and I plant those seed potato uh, pieces 
in the ground, uh, probably about the beginning of May. Onions, I like to buy little tiny on onion seedlings from the garden center. Garlic, I buy cloves or I save my cloves. Swiss chard, waltham, butternut squash, summer squash, pumpkins, I buy seeds and I direct sow them in the middle of May. Um, and that's kind of the things I concentrate on every year. And I would urge you to read up on those and, um, you know, whatever ones you want and figure out how you're going to do that, because that's really what we should be doing right now. It's kind of important to get started on that right now. And you'll learn what things you like to grow and what you're going to skip. Now, I don't grow green beans because green beans grow very fast. I don't end up picking them enough. We don't eat enough of them, although I like them. And, um, you know, it just is something that I couldn't keep up with. So I, I don't grow green beans, but they're one of the easiest things to grow. And I don't want to discourage you if you want to grow them because they're certainly something you can do. So things to think about when you're growing one of these tomatoes, I'll just focus on very, very briefly. And this is the kind of research you want to do. Uh, tomatoes like a lot of sun, water fertilizer. So I got to provide all that. I'm going to provide stakes because they're going to grow tall. I'm going to learn what my spacing is about two and a half feet between plants. I I'm going to know that they're frost sensitive and I'm going to plant those uh, after May 15th. I'm going to learn that I'm not going to plant tomatoes in the same soil year after year because there's diseases that can live in that soil. And I'm going to know that tomatoes take a long time to ripen. If I plant my seedling in May, I may not have a tomato till the end of maybe July in this climate. And I'm going to watch out for certain diseases and insects like the tomato hornworm. So learn about your crop. Okay. And then the question about sowing it inside or outside. Again, we can go into a little more detail here. Um, we sow inside plants that take a long time to develop or are slow to germinate or don't like the early spring weather. We sow outside the plants don't, that don't like to be transplanted, that grow very quickly or which need a lot of like corn. You wouldn't grow those inside, you'd sow those direct outside. So here's a couple lists. Um, I won't go through this all because I'm sure you can find these in books, but certain things like Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, celery, eggplant, kale, leek, onion, pepper, tomato, they take a long time. So we got to start with a transplant. Uh, cucumber, lettuce, melon, parsley, squash, we can have some choices about those. We can do those indoors or outdoors. And outdoors, we would sow definitely things like beans, carrots, beets, peas, radishes, rutabagas, sweet corn, because they develop rapidly and uh, they're perfectly fine growing on their own outside from a seed. Uh, your seed pack can, can tell you a lot. This is a picture of a, a flower garden or a flower balsam seed packet, but your vegetables are going to tell you the same thing uh, on their seed packets. When to start the seeds, it's going to say how many weeks how many, uh, if you should do it indoors or out, uh, those types of things. So your seed packet can be a very important source for information. And if you really want a lot more information about how to start seeds indoors, we have a webinar for that. Go to our YouTube channel. This was recorded in January. It's called The Basics of Seed Starting. And it goes through how to grow plants under lights, how to grow plants in soilless mix in your house and get them all ready for growing outside. Okay, uh, and then back to the garden. We kind of break our crops into certain uh, groups. We would have a, crop, a bunch that can tolerate the cool, wet soil and frost, and those would be peas and spinach and chard. And those would be some of the things I would plant earliest, maybe the end of April. Uh, back in New Jersey, where I'm from, we would plant our peas by St. Patty's Day. Probably a little too ambitious up here in the Capital District, but you know, sometime in April, we can plant some of those crops that don't mind the cool soil and some frost. Um, probably a, later in April, we might plant things like lettuce, some of the broccoli, kale, and some of the root crops, as well as parsley. And those are gonna be things that can tolerate a little frost, so about two to four weeks before our last frost. So that would be about mm, mid-April, end April, something like that. I might think about planting those out. And then there's a lot of things that really have to go out after the frost is over. And those would be the warm season crops like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, the vine crops, all the cucumbers and squash and pumpkins, the snap beans, basil, sweet corn, and sweet potatoes. Now you might say, 
when is the danger of frost past in Rensselaer County? And I would say, I live down there in the left-hand corner in Skodak, which is one of the warmer areas. We probably don't have frost and don't hate me if I'm wrong this year, but it would be about the middle of May. If you're up in Grafton, that might be later May. Uh, some of the county is much colder than the um, western part uh, along the river. We're a little bit warmer. So be careful. May can be a tricky month. We've had snow in May. Um, you know, by the end of May, we're pretty much safe, I think. Uh, but be careful. Don't start things too early would be my, my warning. And then think about you can plant things in the middle of summer that finish up for the uh, season later in the fall. You can plant broccoli, turnips, kale, beets, lettuce, switch charge, and spinach in summer, and those will develop later, and you'll have the second fall crop. So always be aware that you can do multi-season crops and uh, get a lot more in. Uh, transplant shock very quickly is if you have these little seedlings, be careful when you move them outside. I like to put my little seedlings behind my garage in some shade uh, in the beginning of April, or I should say in the beginning of May for a few days before I plant them out in the full bright sunlight because they tend to get a little uh, overwhelmed by going out early. So we call that hardening off of the seedlings. If you get them from a garden center and they've been outside, they're probably okay. If they've been in a greenhouse, you may want to do this process of keeping them a little sheltered for a few days or a week before you plant them out in the garden. Well, let's talk about the style of vegetable gardening you might adopt. You can plant in rows like pl people have planted for thousands of years. And this is a row style vegetable garden. And you can see there's a lot of bare soil around there and a lot of unused area. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons to that. I think that, you know, you can cultivate this with a tractor with a hoe, something like that. It's a very traditional way to grow. Um, you can grow a lot of vegetables in these long rows, but you do spend a lot of time weeding and keeping things uh, looking very neat. My preference nowadays to grow, is to grow in raised beds. I have a lot of these raised bed gardens. And I would say that raised beds will give you less tilling, less weeding, better drainage. You can amend your soil a little easier. You can have a neater garden. Yes, it's gonna cost you more to set up and it's gonna be more time to build these things. But in the long run, a little raised bed is probably gonna be uh, square foot for square foot more productive than a big garden. So think about different ways you can grow. Uh, maybe you've already decided this, but I personally really like raised beds nowadays. Um, on April 28th, we're gonna have our webinar um, on raised beds and talk all about it. And I think it's a great system. Uh, the classic book to look up, is Square Foot Gardening by a man named Mel Bartholomew who taught us how to plant in grids. Here's a couple of his different books he's had over the years. And that's really intensive raised bed gardening. But I think it's a great system for a beginner too. So Mel Bartholomew, uh, one of my favorite authors, and he teaches us all about growing in raised beds that we don't have to have rows like this picture. And why is this raised bed too wide? Well, that's why, I don't know, but I think it is too wide because it's going to be too uh, hard to reach from the side where the lady is standing. So there's a lot of tips to raise beds uh, and you'll get them from Mel Bartholomew or if you attend our webinar on the 28th. And let's give a shout out to, to gardening in containers. Here's some uh, gardening in milk crates. You don't have to have soil. You don't have to have land. You can grow vegetables other ways. I love this idea of milk crate gardening. Uh, we get some landscape fabric, like in the picture on the left there. We line our milk crate with that. We put in some soilless mix we get from the garden center. And we have basically a square foot, one foot by one foot garden there. You can stack these units up. You can have them on a porch or a patio, a great system. We did a demonstration of these at Scattercoke Fair a couple of years ago. Lots of other containers, the old whiskey barrel or wine barrel. There's a nice tomato plant growing in that. Um, could be put together for a moderate price, I think. Uh, that picture down in the corner there, that's a high-tech growing system. You can see how perfect that tomato plant is. That's a little misleading, I think. But you get the idea. There's lots of containers you can use. You can use, you know, five-gallon buckets. You can use straw bales that we're going to talk about next week. So don't be limited if you don't have a big piece of land. 
Okay, uh, the Cornell PowerPoint talked about don't waste space. All right, if you have a garden in the ground, the idea is to plant early crops in between later crops. So this picture is showing melon plants in the middle there, and melon plants are going to be trailing vines. And as those melons grow farther out into those snap beans, the snap beans are going to be finishing, and you can pull out the dead snap bean plants and let the melons take over. So when you get a little more sophisticated, I think you can plan out this idea of succession garden, gardening where one crop takes over from another. Or another idea here is that we plant uh, crops in succession. And here we have an example of spinach planted every two weeks. You say, well, I don't want a lot of spinach every week because I can't eat that much. So you plant maybe one row of spinach every other week and you have spinach for a longer time, okay? Uh, don't plant all of your spinach at once. Uh, so some crops are like that. Now, other crops, maybe you don't do that with. And when you're doing your research for each crop, you would try to figure that out. So sometimes we do this idea of succession planting. Um, and again, going back to that seed packet or your, your research, don't plant things too closely. That corn in the background there, uh, that's way too close. And those plants are not going to really develop very well. Uh, so spacing is really important. Plants like to be close enough that they cross pollinate maybe if they need to do that um, and crowd out the weeds, but we don't want to have them too close where they don't produce well. So spacing is important. And here is a long complicated chart that they've given us and you can't really get all this in at one look, but uh, each of the crops has how much, an estimate of how much we can produce from it and how much uh, we should pack into a row how much we should pack into a square foot if we're going to do the Mel Bartholomew square foot. So that's the idea. Um, and here's don't waste space, don't overplant. In a two foot by two foot or a four foot section, you could have one plant that would grow you 25 tomatoes, uh, 16 leaf lettuces or Boston lettuces, five to 10 cucumbers, or one ear of corn or one third of pumpkin. Now the subliminal message here, I think, is that they're telling you that some crops are worth more than others. And a lot of vegetable garden books will tell you, don't grow corn because it takes up too much space. It's not worth it. A, one corn plant takes up a lot of area and you only get one ear of corn on one corn plant. But I don't agree with that. I think if you have always dreamed of planting sweet corn, you should plant sweet corn and that's what you should grow. So grow what you want. Uh, take that kind of advice, I think with a little bit of a grain of salt. Now there's a lot of different vegetable varieties and Cornell has another great resource here. It's called the Vegetable Variety uh, for Gardeners website. And there it is, vegvariety.cce.cornell.edu. And um, you can Google that or just Google Vegetable Varieties for Gardeners Cornell. And you'll get to a place that looks like this. This is a publication. It's in a PDF form as well as a website format. And here's uh, these varieties have all been looked at for New York. So if you're interested in really becoming the world's best grower of broccoli, let's say, well, here's a list of all the different types of broccoli you can grow. And these are ones that have grown well in upstate New York, or I should say most in New York, because uh, we probably have a little Long Island data in there too. But uh, these are proven, you know, varieties for the Northeast. And um, it's really good if you really get into vegetable gardening a little bit more perhaps and are looking at seed catalogs and find that, gee, the seed company is selling 10 different types of broccoli. Which one did the best in New York? Well, go to this Cornell website and see if the name is listed there. And it's a really great resource that's been done for many years. I don't know that it's really well known by a lot of gardeners, but it has a lot of great information. Okay, another uh, idea is to grow up. Sometimes we forget about that when we're growing in the ground or in a raised bed. Uh, vertical gardening, a lot of things like tomatoes, cucumbers, climbing beans, um, even some squash can be trained to grow up. So you're taking advantage of that vertical height, that vertical space. And usually those crops get plenty of sunlight by growing up. So here's a framework that somebody's contrived in a raised bed garden, you can use string that looks like pole beans, maybe they're growing at that school. And that's just another great hint. Here's another great simple, simple way to grow your pole beans up. And that really 
expand your gardening because you're growing a lot more in a limited space. Um, there's an admonition here to put it out on paper. Now, I don't typically do that. I have a lot of this in my head, I think. But as a beginning gardener, maybe your first year, you want to do some sketches. You want to, you know, measure out your garden on graph paper. I used to do that quite a bit and plant out, plan out your plants, um, you know, using a graphic kind of method. You could plan out how long those crops are going to be in uh, when you do your research on each crop. And maybe that's how you could get to the idea of succession planting. Um, and another idea that's really important too is called crop rotation. Now for your first year, you're not going to worry about that because your first year, your soil is the first year that it's had vegetables growing in it. But if you grow vegetables year after year in the same garden, what you want to do is plant different types of crops in a given space. You don't want to plant tomatoes every year in the same spot. Um, and this is kind of just an idea that I'll leave you with to think about for the future. Uh, plants are grouped into families. Uh, there's the crucifer family, the cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, radish, turnips. There's the nightshade family, the tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers. So the idea here is you don't want to plant the same family over and over again um, because that tends to be uh, a way that diseases and insects build up and also tends to wear out your soil because each of these crops likes slightly different amount of nutrients and leaves the soil itself in a different way. So organic farmers will do this idea of crop rotation, planting different families in that spot year after year. Okay, so weeds, you know, that's gonna be really a problem. Here's the guy and he's had a little bit too much fun this summer, he hasn't been weeding. Good grief, Martha, the beets have disappeared. And that's what you don't want to have happen. Uh, the idea is that weeds, if left to flower and get large, will shade out the crop and will also drop a lot of seeds. And those seeds will come back to haunt you. So <laughs> that's what we want to not have happen. So never let your weeds get ahead of you or make seeds. And one of the ways around that is to use mulch. Uh, the classic thing of covering the bare earth with some sort of material to keep the weeds at bay. Um, and I would say, do we use straw or do we use hay? And hopefully you wouldn't use hay because hay tends to have a lot of weed seeds in it. You can use a good wheat straw or good oat straw, and that tends to have a lot less weed seeds in the straw itself. So straw is a good option. You can buy that at a garden center or maybe an Agway type store and put maybe a couple inches of straw in between your rows or, or on the soil that's not going to have a crop in it right away. Um, other mulches could be newspaper, cardboard, untreated grass clippings. That kind of blurry picture there on the left-hand side is showing people using these materials and that's certainly perfectly acceptable. It used to be some cause for concern about using colored newspaper, but that really is not a problem anymore. The inks are a lot safer than they used to be. Uh, but just don't bury the little plants too much. There's a little cucurbit seedling there and they've got grass clippings around it. Uh, you don't want to bury it too much. And also with grass clippings, make sure you use only grass clippings from a lawn that hasn't been chemically treated uh, for at least a few weeks because those grass clippings can have herbicide or, or other bad things on them. I use leaves. Uh, this is my leaf mulch pile. In the fall, I don't throw my leaves over the edge of the woods, the, over the cliff there. I don't put them out for the town to collect, which they don't do anyway, but I chop them up and I make a pile. And this leaf mulch is the best mulch in the world. So consider making your own leaf mulch, chopping up your leaves, leaving them sit over the fall. In the spring, it's fantastic, it's free, it's organic, it's the best mulch you could ever wanna have. I also use black plastic mulch. Here's a tomato bed I've created with my tomato support systems all in place, my black plastic. Um, and I would have prepared my soil, put the black plastic on top of the raised bed, poked the holes, planted the plants, and then put on the tomato cages and the posts. And quite honestly, that garden is very little work after it's all set up like that. I have no weeding to do. I have very little watering to do. I have a drip hose underneath I can turn on. I'm sitting back and harvesting tomatoes. So very simple. 
okay, is it really a pest? Um, it's really kind of too hard for us to talk a lot about pests tonight, but we'll just touch upon a couple ideas here. And certainly if you have any questions with your vegetable garden, you can give us a call, give us an email uh, during the season. Pictures are really good uh, because there's a lot of insects that you're gonna come across. They're not all bad, okay? And this is what they're trying to say here is that on the left, there's a Mexican bean beetle and that's going to be a beetle that likes to eat the foliage of beans, which is not good. And next to that, on the right hand, there's an Asian uh, ladybird beetle, or what we would call a ladybug, maybe. That's a good guy. That eats aphids and other harmful insects. So the one on the left is the pest of snap beans, but they look kind of similar. So before you spray anything, or heaven forbid, uh, use an insecticide, make sure you know what you've got. Uh, you've got there and we can help you or certainly you can look things up on the internet. There's a great website called Bug Guide. Bug Guide. You can Google that one. There's millions of pictures of insects uh, and you can maybe figure out what you've got. Um, you know, if your tomatoes go off color, is it a problem? Well, on the left is tomato light blight. That's a very devastating disease of tomatoes caused by a fungus. Uh, on the right-hand side, that's cracking just caused by uneven watering. So, you know, again, send us a picture. We'll help you out with your diagnostic stuff. If you're a new gardener, there's a lot to be concerned about, and uh, we're certainly always happy to take a look. Um, so how can you minimize these problems? Well, they give you three top hints here, and I agree with that. Plant-resistant varieties. You know, if you go to a garden center, you're probably going to get pretty good varieties. Um, they're going to help you out with that. Keep the leaves dry. Don't water too much. And when you water, keep the foliage dry. Water down low. And remove sick plants or leaves on plants as soon as possible. If you see something going wrong and we determine it is a problem, get rid of it because that may help reduce the spread. Um, also think about other pests. And we don't have, again, enough time to talk about this in great depth. But you might have deer. You might have groundhogs. You might have rabbits. And uh, those are very common problems in Rensselaer County. Uh, one of the most uh, effective ways is a fence. And, you know, as a beginning gardener, maybe you don't know what kind of problems you have, so you don't have to put up a fence right away, but you may end up having to fence in part of your garden. Here's one of our master gardeners, Kathy Towns, raised bed vegetable garden. Many years ago, she's got chicken wire around there, and that would keep out a lot of different pests, maybe not the tallest or most persistent deer, but certainly groundhogs would be deterred by that chicken wire fence that you could throw around that area. And here's Kathy Town's really lovely picket fence around the rest of her vegetable garden. Now, again, it's your first year, you're not going to do that, but, but be aware that we do have these critters and you might end up having to do something like a fence, or I think I have down there, where do I have the repellent word? Whoops, well, the other option are repellents, and those are chemicals that you can mix up and spray. They're safe to use on vegetable plants. Uh, you can find a wide variety of those sold at garden centers, places like that, or you can make your own. Uh, there's an egg-based repellent. That's very common uh, on the internet. You can type in deer repellent eggs and get a recipe, and uh, that will deter the deer as well. And then finally, just an admonition to clean up at the end. Um, usually at the end of the season, there's a lot of different crummy looking vegetables. Your plants are kind of tired. There's things rotting. Um, you know, most of that probably could go into a compost pile. Uh, most of that is not going to uh, be a problem the next year as long as you kind of have all of that break down. Uh, there's a few exceptions to that, but I would not put weeds with seeds in my uh, compost pile. That would be kind of a no-no, but it's good to clean up these uh, materials off of your garden because that gets them away from the area and uh, maybe breaks the cycle of how they perpetuate in the soil, in the garden. So um, one other resource here, we have a vegetable blog. Believe it or not, Rensselaer County has its own vegetable garden blog. It's run by a master gardener named Irv Stevens. And Irv puts up lots of different uh, tips and information on vegetable gardening. You can get there by Googling Rensselaer County Vegetable Blog 
and uh, check out his really great work there. So whew, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, sure. Well, about an hour, which I was shooting for. And again, we're here to help. That's our phone number there, 518-272-4210. You can certainly email me at dhc3 at cornell.edu. Uh, you can ask us about pH tests. You can ask us to look at a plant sample. You can look at, a, we can look at a photo for you. We can answer your questions. So please uh, don't hesitate to uh, contact us.